Kia ora koto. Welcome to the Getting On Board webinar. My name is Helen Bartle and I'm the Senior Advisor for Audience Development and Capability Building at Creative New Zealand. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this first webinar to launch the newly revised publication Getting On Board, a governance resource for arts organisations. The webinar this morning will be led by Graham Narkis from BoardWorks International. Graham, as many of you will know, is the author of Getting On Board and has worked extensively with Creative New Zealand and the wider sector over many years since the late 90s to enhance government governance capability. We're delighted that so many of you could join us today board members and management across New Zealand to hear from Graham on key factors that are central to boardroom effectiveness. We will break for questions after each section and you are currently on mute to avoid any background noise but if you do have a question just note it in the Q&A box on the right hand side, the bottom of the screen on the right hand side or tell us you have a question in that box and you can ask it in person. Both the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation will be made available via Creative New Zealand's website, so don't feel you have to make copious notes. So without further delay, welcome to you, Graham. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to be joining you this morning. and. Uh, Good to see a number of old friends amongst the registrants for the webinar this morning as well. Um, I want to talk initially just briefly about uh, this latest edition of Getting On Board um, and firstly to thank Creative New Zealand for presenting the material in such an attractive, uh, well-designed manner as indeed the previous uh, editions have been as well. Um, as, as Helen said, uh, this was first produced back in the late 1990s and it was based on some intensive research, intensive and extensive research that I did with a number of uh, what were then Creative New Zealand's currently funded organisations. Um, it was intended to support a range of different governance capability building initiatives including uh, training but I don't think at the time we ever imagined we might be delivering some of this uh, via this current webinar form that was very much in the future. Uh, the, the current issue, the fourth edition, has been completely revised and updated um, early on in the document and I guess uh, many of you have seen it already. Uh, there is a reference to the main changes uh, that I've made in this current edition, particularly to extend the explanation of some of the concepts and, and add some new material, uh, which I know from working with a number of your organisations uh, you were looking to see. <coughs> um, obviously, to keep the document to a reasonable size, we've also had to drop some of it out, um, but I don't think that's done any harm in the new material is, is worth having, I think. You'll see on, on the, the screen at the moment, uh, if you don't already have a copy of the new version, uh, how you can obtain it. And uh, I'd encourage those of you who haven't got it uh, to get it uh, as soon as you can. So uh, the way we've designed these two webinars is to try and highlight some of the new or revised material, but I'm also going to explore some aspects of good governance that are easily neglected or misunderstood. The structure today has three parts. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the importance of the board's accountability to an organisation's owners. Um, that perhaps uh, is one of the newer sections of getting on board or it certainly it's been expanded to explore that issue. Uh, the second one is the determination of organisational purpose and, and the direction of the organisation. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk this morning about the articulation of, of governance policy. After each of those sections, we'll pause briefly uh, to see if there's any questions uh, before we go on to the next topic. Uh, some of you might find the uh, use or the application of the word leadership to the board's role a little unusual. Um, in the sector, boards in the past have often interpreted their role in relatively passive and limiting ways, uh, but the future of any organisation lies primarily in the hands of its board. Uh, the buck stops with the board, 
boards must therefore lead. I tend to think of the type of leadership a board needs to apply as, as what has been called servant leadership. The person that gets uh, credited with a lot of the original thought around the application of that concept to governance is a guy called Robert Greenleaf who was uh, writing 40 years or so ago and uh, he contributed a series of es uh, essays and they were published in this book. This is the, the, what's the, on the cover of mine but I know that more recent editions and it is easily obtained uh, because it's been reprinted numerous times. Uh, but he, he talked about uh, servant leadership being an exploration of a journey into the nature of legitimate power and greatness, which all sounds very grand, and uh, it is uh, in many respects. Uh, if, if any of you uh, haven't got time to read the book and wanted a potted version of what Greenlee's talking about, uh, later in the uh, slide deck uh, there is uh, my website address and if you go into that you can find our online publication board works and in issue 12 uh, there is an article which is called Excellence in Trusteeship, the Greenleaf Challenge uh, and it will give you a bit of a, a sense of what he was talking about. Um, we're not going to spend too much more time on it today but I, there's a couple of quotes, uh, a couple on the screen. Uh, but there's another one that I might just start off with. Greenleaf said that too many boards settle for being critics and experts. There is too much intellectual wheel spinning, too much retreating into research, too little preparation for and willingness to undertake the hard and high risk tasks of building better institutions in an imperfect world. So you can see from that uh, that he sets his sights pretty high and he's very demanding of the efforts uh, that boards should make and those that serve on boards should make, as that first quote on the screen says, those serving on boards should accept a dynamic obligation to be an insistent driving force, obliging an institution to move towards distinction. The second quote is uh, probably a reinforcement of that, but I chose it because it's making reference to trustees, board members as trustees, and about the importance of them driving their organisations and making sure that it's adequately cared for. So let's just explore that a wee bit more. How does a board accept that challenge that Greenleaf's given us? And that challenge incidentally is increasingly reflected in changes to the legal environment that we work in, uh, those laws that impact on the way organisations are governed. It also is reflected in the expectations of the stakeholders, including, not least, funding bodies like Creative New Zealand. So the starting point is to recognise uh, that the work of the board is different from the work of staff. And on a lot of our boards in the sector, uh, board members are also, in a sense, voluntary staff members, but we've got to keep those two hats separate. Central activity of any board, I tend to think, is uh, the job of thinking things through, hence the reference to the essential work being intellectual in its orientation. For me, there are two principal dimensions to that. And these also relate back to that concept of trusteeship. The first one is clearly articulating why, for example, an organisation exists and what it should achieve. What direction should it be heading in? What should it prior, its priorities be? How will it know that it's been successful? And so on. The second dimension, which is ancillary to this, is also thinking about the situations and circumstances that the organisation should avoid, the things that might cripple it financially or uh, impact negatively on its reputation. So we can start off with that little backdrop, that little introduction uh, on the first main topic this morning. And that is boards expressing their accountability to owners. Who does a board serve at the end of the day? And in the first instance, it's really the organisation's owners. No board exists in isolation. A board doesn't just magically appear from nowhere. Initially it emerges from the founding and incorporation process, but as it ages and grows, others 
than other than the founders uh, often become involved, uh, and whatever the stage of organisational evolution, the board and whoever's currently on it can also always be thought of as a subset of the owners. The board represents and discharges the owner's interests. Uh, that accountability must be discharged in the interests of all owners collectively, not just those with the loudest voice uh, or the biggest checkbook. Sometimes owners are very easily identified. Uh, for example, uh, members of an incorporated society or uh, shareholders in a company. But in, in many cases uh, that we deal with in the arts and cultural sector, those aren't the sort of legal entities that, that uh, are responsible for your organisations. We have trusts, we have statutory bodies and the like. And we need to go searching for what John Carver, an American governance theorist, has described as the moral onus. It's important when we think about owners not to confuse them with other types of stakeholder. For example, funders that I referred to before. Uh, those other stakeholders uh, clearly have a, a very significant interest in the organisation, but they're not the people who are ultimately affected by whether the organisation exists or not. The, the other reference on the screen is to board members as fiduciaries. That's to say they act on behalf of the interests of others. And again, principally but not exclusively owners. And that's been brought home, uh, for example, recently and, and it's still an evolving area in New Zealand, but in relation to board responsibilities for health and safety. Uh, you know, the Pike River incident and, and others have underlined that uh, the board ultimately is accountable for other stakeholders as well. However, when we think about uh, fiduciaries, it's particularly helpful to think of perhaps the key one of the, those being the duty of care. And to me, that boils down to boards just being active in their jobs, understanding the job, taking the job seriously, being diligent, paying attention, uh, etc. So let's just explore this ownership uh, concept a little bit more. You know, um, the, 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 the sort of duty of care that I just referred to can be thought of in a sort of stewardship sense and by reference to the assets for which the board is responsible. Sometimes those are hard, tangible assets, you know, a theatre, um, a library of musical scores, um, depository of visual artworks. But assets can also be soft. For example, an organisation's reputation, uh, its good name. Um, so we can think about the owner's perspective as being the equivalent of a concern for the value of those assets. If you think about your own personal circumstances, if, if you uh, own an asset, you know, um, in an artistic sense, for example, it might be a valuable painting. Normally, uh, you'll care for it, you'll preserve it, uh, you'll mount it carefully, you'll worry about the temperature and the humidity, you'll worry about its security and all the rest of it. Uh, you want to preserve and enhance uh, that, uh, that painting and its uh, intrinsic uh, benefits for yourself and possible future owners. Uh, you would only uh, cease to think of it as an asset um, if, if you found that, uh, for example, if I used the painting idea again, if it was, was a fake and really wasn't worth anything. Um, and it's only then that you might neglect it uh, or, or even abandon it or destroy it. So uh, we can take those ideas a stage further and, and, and think about what uh, a responsible owner uh, does. What's the perspective that he or she takes? Firstly, I think it's to care for that asset's value beyond their own personal use of it and to be concerned with it as a whole. Um, our painting analogy perhaps doesn't work there, but think about a house if you own a house. You're not just going to be concerned about uh, your favourite room in that house. You want the whole house to be functional and uh, uh, safe and, and comfortable, uh, warm, uh, weather tight, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, you want an asset to be productive, uh, to have utility. 
and uh, you want it to be safe. At the board level, it gets quite interesting because sometimes you will find yourselves as board members having to protect owners, whether they are uh, proprietary owners or, or the sort of moral owners that I refer to, you have to protect them from themselves. And I found that this is quite a useful way to, to think about that perspective. And it's thinking about uh, if, if your owners were in your position, how would they decide? How would they vote in a sense? And you're in a very privileged position as board members and you're required both individually and collectively collectively to think independently about what is in the owner's collective best interests. So the way I tend to think about it is, is to try and think uh, about how might they act if they knew what I know. Board members are often in possession of information and knowledge that individual owners don't have. If owners had a future perspective. You know, owners are often distracted by their perception of short-term interests. And as fiduciaries, as board members, we must be concerned for longer-term asset value. Boards are required to think longer-term, and often this is longer-term than your owners. Also, if they had an obligation uh, to represent the interests of all owners, not just their own personal interests, and that's the essence of that fiduciary responsibility, to put other people's interests ahead of your own. And, and finally, if they could take a wider view of things, uh, it's not uncommon that a major benefactor, for example, of an orchestra, he or she might want to influence that orchestra's program in the direction of a particular composer. But too much of that composer's repertoire likely to alienate or bore the orchestra's wider audience and probably the orchestra itself. So that was what I was going to say briefly, I admit, uh, in relating point for a lot of the work of the board that follows. So I'm looking at, uh, at a couple of questions here, and uh, no doubt you can see them on the screen. Uh, the governing boards you're referring to only for trusts. Uh, I've just lost that q and A, I'm afraid. Hi, Graham. So Macarita has asked a couple of questions. Um, in fact, she's just wanting to confirm our governing boards you're referring to only for trusts, charitable organisations. Um, models or more broader. So some of our Kahikatea organisations are limited companies. Yeah, no, those those concepts are applicable to all governing boards regardless of the, the legal framework that they operate under. The difference is that sometimes the laws that relate to different types of entities spell those fiduciary duties and the other things out more specifically than others. Uh, if any of you are on incorporated societies, you'll be aware that the Law Commission uh, has been reviewing uh, the legislation. And it's, it was passed, of course, in 1908, and it's long overdue for a bit of an overhaul. But uh, the, the way the Law Commission has approached it and the way the government's likely to pick up on it is to uh, really reinforce and, and be much more explicit about those directors' duties in relation to that type of entity. Does anyone else have a question at this stage before we move on to the second section? Uh, Helen, it's Vanessa here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. So we just had a, an also a question here from NZ Trio um, about moral owners of the trust, um, whether um, we could get a clarification on who the owners would be for a musical group that set up a char charitable trust. But where you've got a foundation that supports a musical group, there, doesn't, there don't appear to be any owners. I think those type of circumstances uh, in both cases underline the importance of that concept of moral owners because uh, you, know, you don't have in a, in a trust or a foundation situation any external accountability. You don't have to report to anyone, for example. So it's really the challenge for the board to then go 
and try and seek, um, you know, as I said, the, the concept of moral owners because it's important for a board to think about who are we doing this for, on whose behalf are we acting. In some cases, those um, you know, primary uh, stakeholders may exist within the organisation. Sometimes they might be outside the organisation or a combination of both. Okay, thanks Graham. I think we should move on now. Okay, that's okay. I just heard somebody say it's a bit of a conundrum. It is. Uh, this is why I said that before that uh, board's job, their, their work is thinking things through and this is one of the things that they have to think through. Who are we accountable to? Who are we doing this for? Um, so that naturally takes us or easily takes us into the second uh, chunk of this this morning and that is the thing about determining purpose and strategic direction. Uh, it's an important responsibility of any board to understand and to be able to articulate the reason for the organisation's existence and the direction in which it should be heading. Um, unfortunately, that's not something boards always do very well. Uh, it's often something that the board leaves to staff to sort out, uh, but it's something that the board must ultimately be accountable for. Uh, for years, boards and management teams, and many of you will have been involved in these sorts of exercises of agonising over high-level vision and mission statements, for example. Uh, all too often, uh, what results from what has been a great deal of time and effort is a set of rhetorical statements. It sounds good on the day, but when you come to revisit them a few weeks later, you, you sort of think, what, what were we thinking? What, what are we trying to say here? Uh, and those, those statements often reflect a great deal of wishful thinking and they're often too abstract to be of any practical use. Unfortunately, those statements also tend to reflect uh, and try and describe, sometimes at great length, the business activity of the organisation rather than what it is that that activity should result in. You know, organisations exist to achieve something worthwhile, to have some sort of impact on their world to produce outcomes or results or to deliver benefits. Uh, the actual activity that they undertake is simply a means to those ends, although it might be quite central to those ends as well in some art forms. Um, but you might wonder why I've got a Dilbert cartoon on, on this slide. It, it's because Scott Adams, who is the creator of the Dilbert cartoon character, observed once that a typical mission statement is a long, awkward sentence that demonstrates the board's inability to think clearly. So for those reasons, it's, it's really important to start with the end in mind. And there's some, some little ways, uh, easy ways in some respects, that you can test the usefulness of your own equivalent statements. Um, for example, if you were to put some other organisation's name in front of your mission statement, if, if we're thinking about mission statements, um, would it make any difference? So in other words, does it differentiate your organisation from another one, even if it's in the same sort of um, art form? I'll come back to that a little bit more uh, in a few slides. So to be effective in giving direction, you know, we talk about uh, company board members as being directors and increasingly that generic term gets applied into other governance environments as well. But if we... Graham, sorry to interrupt you, but we're just going to have to take over control of the slides. Can you just let us know what slide you're on and then yeah, just sure. say change slide so we can go to the next one? They're not, they're not changing. No. So what it slide should, are you on? It should be on slide 12. The, slide uh, 12, great. And then if you can just say change slide to us, we'll go to the next one so we can keep okay. up with you. Apologies for that. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So uh, the board's got to keep focused on why the enterprise exists and that revolves around what it should achieve rather than what it does. In other words, the activities that it undertakes in pursuit of, of its desired achievements. Boards have got little enough time as it is to do the work that's necessary for effective corporate direction and control. Too many boards, uh, and you may have experienced this, get mired in a morass of 
what is usually a short-term or immediate and comparatively mundane operational detail. That tendency crowds out the more important future-oriented discussions about organisational purpose and direction and, and about the achievement of real and beneficial results. Getting buried in operational detail is also illogical because a board can hardly judge the relevance or effectiveness of a particular activity, uh, practices, methods, projects, contracts, or whatever, unless there's clarity about what end those alternative means should serve. Um, I, I put on that slide the quote from John Carver and, and one of his key collaborators, um, Carolyn Oliver, uh, it's a really neat encapsulation of, of this challenge. Ends distinguish purpose from path, results from process, and where one is going from how one is going to get there. So in a sense, it's about first things first. It doesn't mean, however, that a board shouldn't have any interest in operational means. Uh, very rarely can it be said that the ends justify the means. Those ends should be stated as clearly as possible, but equally a board also needs to express to itself uh, and to its staff a clear sense of what situations and circumstances uh, would be unacceptable. Uh, change slide, please. Hello, I'm not getting any slides changing. Mine's not changing on my screen either, shall I <laughs> try and change it again myself. Helen? Yeah, the slide is changing with us, so um, we're, we're on the slide starting point, organisational purpose. Okay, okay, well I've just changed it on mine. I hope it doesn't cut across anything that you've just done. Uh, my slides are not changing at all. Perhaps you could manually change them at the top, which um, is the um, arrow backwards and forwards. Can you see the arrow on the top left-hand corner, which uh, it should say slide 13, starting point, organisational purpose? No, I don't have that. Okay, well, look, I'd better carry on, and, yeah. and I will say when I'm changing slides. If anyone has to do it manually, as I've just had to do, um, just sort of popped on, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get there. So. Uh, an important responsibility of any board, and it's probably the starting point for any serious decision making, is to understand and to be able to articulate the reasons for the organisation's existence. As I said earlier on, what, what is the impact that it exists to have on the world in which it operates? That can usually be expressed in terms of, of two things. Firstly, the benefits that the organisation intends to deliver, and the intended recipients of those benefits. So what, what benefits for what people? And I'm going to show you now another slide. Uh, if we can change the slide, Helen. Um, and this is a, a real life example from uh, one of the regional orchestras. Uh, and this was uh, developed by uh, my business partner who chairs this particular orchestra uh, in their uh, strategic thinking session recently, and this is what they came up with, and it's got these two dimensions that I've just referred to in it, the benefit and the beneficiaries. So the, the, the benefit is uh, that the organisation provides access to affordable, high quality orchestral music that enriches and entertains. And the beneficiaries are really clear. They're to be the people of West Auckland. This is not an orchestra that has ambitions of touring, for example, or even playing on the other side of town. It exists for the benefit of the people of West Auckland. Change the slide, please, Helen. So if this activity, this articulation is important, it follows that the greater part of the board's time should be focused on the future. Uh, you know, it's a matter of logic, I guess, that the board can only influence what has not yet happened. Now, that's not to say, in terms of, of this quote, that the board is responsible for creating the future minding the shop. It doesn't mean that, in fact, 
some board members and some boards and some organisations don't need to do some shop minding activity as well, but it is not a core governance function. Boards, when they're required to work in as well as on an organisation, should think of that activity, that shop minding activity, as being something distinctly different and something that could be delegated and should be delegated when it's possible. Now, the getting on board document contains a lot of content in relation to this aspect of the board's job. Uh, I'll touch on a little bit more, but uh, I just encourage you to read those sections of getting on board. This morning I just want to make the point that for a board to be effective in relation to its strategic thinking role, it must organise the way it spends its time to ensure that that happens. It must deliberately plan its work so that it is giving strategic direction to the organisation. Uh, you know, various people have different theories about what the proportion of that time is, but given, as I said before, you can only affect what hasn't yet happened, I would have thought that at least two-thirds of the time at any given board meeting should be spent facing the future rather than looking at the past. Change the slide, please, Helen. So on this next slide, I want to just talk about uh, some of the ways in which a board can be confident that it will be giving enough time and attention, giving enough time and attention to important strategic issues. And there's a range of strategic thinking tools described in getting on board. So again, I don't want to, to uh, go over those, but I do want to emphasize these three elements that, that are listed on the screen. Uh, they're, they're techniques of ensuring that in a general sense the board is operating at that sort of strategic level. So the starting point for me is to have a longer term work plan. Now a, a 12 month period is usually uh, a useful uh, period of time to do that over. And the exercise is essentially about identifying and then scheduling into the board work program attention to important strategic issues. And getting those in the right sequence uh, so that each successive board meeting builds on the previous discussions, there's some continuity and connection, and, and to ensure that those uh, things are the things that are really important for the board to be working on. The second thing is for them to create a board meeting structure, an agenda structure if you like, that gives priority to strategic level matters. So the first one I've listed there is environmental monitoring. Um, this doesn't mean doing some sort of uh, structured SWOT exercise uh, at each meeting, but it does mean keeping your eyes and ears open for what's going on around the organisation and giving you some uh, yourself some time at each board meeting just to collect that sort of, if you like, market intelligence that will be gathered up between meetings by uh, individual board members and staff. The second thing then is, is uh, making sure that the board meeting uh, gives priority to the exploration of those important strategic issues that come off the annual agenda or the annual work plan. The board meetings should be organised around those strategic issues. They should be the first thing on the agenda before you get into uh, reports and, and various other um, activities that you have to undertake. Um, this, the third thing there is, is about giving yourselves time to define problems and articulate the results that you want to achieve before you jump into solutions and decision making. Um, you know, I see it all the time with boards that I work with that they, everyone comes to the table um, with ideas about what the organisation should be doing differently, could be doing differently, solutions uh, usually to problems, but often the board hasn't taken the time to reach some sort of shared view of what that problem actually is, so problem definition uh, is really important. And the final thing, uh, which reinforces the board's strategic role, is monitoring organisational performance in a way that gets the board focused on whether the organisation is making progress against things that are important. So is traction being gained in relation to desired strategic outcomes? 
not too many days go by that I don't find myself involved in a, a conversation with board members or sometimes chief executives and other senior executives who bemoan the fact that the diet that boards receive for board meetings is frequently just activity reports, which tell you not a lot more than whether the organisation and the staff in it are busy, not whether that busyness is achieving the results that you want. So, um, Helen, let's pause now for questions on this section uh, of the webinar. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Graham. Um, if anyone has a question, um, the best way to unmute yourself is to press star six on your phone keypad, and then you'll unmute yourself and be able to ask Graham a question. No? Okay, so if we don't have any questions, I think we should move on. Carry on, good, okay. So the third and final topic that we're going to explore this morning is policy making. Um, the, the job of the board, as this uh, slide says, is to ensure that the organisation is well managed without the board doing the managing itself. And that means that the board, in a sense, has to operate by some form of remote control. Now, the remote control that I'm referring to here, which gives the board the ability to ensure that its expectations are being met uh, in real time, not just when it is sitting in its board meetings once a month or, or even uh, less frequently than that, is this sort of policy framework that it, that it uh, uh, might set out. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of the board's policy making activity. And that should be proactive, it should be done ahead of time. It's very difficult to make policy uh, after something perhaps has gone wrong. Uh, there's been some mishap or misunderstanding. Um, one of the areas that I see it happening all the time, for example, is in relation to dealing with conflicts of interest. It's very difficult to deal easily uh, with a conflict of interest after that conflict has become apparent. Far better to proactively set out how it is uh, that you expect board members to behave, how you expect uh, conflicts of interest to be handled, to describe those uh, ahead, of, ahead of time which may actually prevent the conflict from arising in the first place, but will certainly give you a, an objective way of dealing with it if, it if it does. So let's move on to the next slide, Helen, please. It's just a, a, a brief definition of, of governance policy. What does policy mean in this, this context? Um, my colleagues and I have played around with all sorts of different definitions over the years, but they tend to have uh, fairly common elements to it. And that starts with the board's values. What is important to board members? What, what are the things that they want to, the values, the philosophies and so forth, they want to guide the organisation's actions? These get translated into explicit written statements and those are specifically designed to set out those expectations and to create a framework for monitoring performance. Ultimately, of course, what we need is some sort of framework which enables the board to be confident, to be truly accountable for everything that goes on in the organisation. How long to change the slide, please? So we think about um, governance policies framing everything that goes on in the organisation, framing, guiding, influence, giving meaning to what happens in the organisation. In this sense, I mean framing in the sense that it encompasses or embraces or encloses all the myriad of decisions that are made throughout the organisation. All of that should be able to be conducted with reference back to some sort of governance policy. And for that reason, we say that board decisions should predominantly be policy decisions. And I'm going to explain the benefits of doing that now. So, Helen, slide change again, please. This slide documents the sort of benefits 
that you get from a coherent and comprehensive governance policy framework. And I should say that quite a lot of the, uh, the material in getting on board includes examples of what the sort of policy might look like. So a coherent and comprehensive policy framework provides these benefits. It ensures that all parts of the organisation are aligned uh, and in pursuit of a clearly divine, defined vision of success. Uh, it allows the board to influence everything that is important in the organisation without having to sit around the clock to make all the decisions. In other words, this policy framework allows the board to get leverage over everything that happens in the organisation. Thirdly, the process involves the definition of decision making rights. Somebody once said that basically corporate or, or organisational governance is really about the allocation of decision making rights. And in our work uh, when we are uh, involved in trying to help boards sort through uh, problems, uh, often it's traceable back to lack of clarity about whose decision is it. By doing, or by defining those decision making rights, it creates an accountability framework. And implicit in that, and I'm making it explicit, is it sets performance expectations and gives you some sort of criteria for then monitoring performance. In the absence of, of policy criteria, it's difficult for staff to know what they should be reporting to the board because anything and everything could be relevant. But the policy framework immediately creates much better definition of what information the board needs. Change the slide please, Helen. Now, this is different in many respects from the way boards have traditionally operated. And I said earlier on that boards are often very passive. They sit waiting for proposals to be brought to them by staff. However, un and unfortunately, the act of approving often uh, forces the board to become tied up in a whole lot of trivia, uh, which is frustrating both for board members and staff alike. And it means that what is approvable is seldom clear to staff before they start the process. So the policy making process effectively creates a context within which staff have got much clearer idea of what will be approvable and what should be taken to the board in the first place. If the board simply approves things that come to them without any pre-work, it means that uh, the detail of the decision is forever frozen until it comes back to the board to get the board's approval to change it. It means that staff are hamstrung in many ways. They're not able to move fast to be responsible to emerging situations, particularly to, to emerging opportunities. And it tends to dull their creativity as well. The other thing uh, which I think is very important and, and uh, neglected by most boards is the post-decision or post-program implementation evaluation. If you haven't got clear uh, objectives, policy objectives for those programs in the first place, it's pretty near impossible to evaluate whether you've achieved the results that you wanted. Uh, Helen, next slide please, slide 23. So we tend to say that, that ad hoc board approval is a pretty blunt and ineffective way for a board to control what happens in an organisation. And uh, the comments on this slide uh, repeat some of the comments I've already made. But let me just highlight the second one. Uh, if all the board does is simply wait for other people to take initiatives, they very seldom have the time they need to think things through and decide for themselves uh, the very things that would make those approvals processes uh, necessary in the first place. The other thing that, that flows from this sort of ad hoc reactive approach is that boards often have very little time to consider the proposal and to think it through in a principled sort of way and that often results in quite poor decisions. And before very long you often find boards and staff are backtracking on what was a very firm decision taken only a short time earlier. Next slide please Helen. 
So if the board has been effective in its policy making process, it makes everyone's life a lot easier. Both staff and board can have confidence about what's approvable. Um, it also has the benefit of reducing the amount of individual influence that might be brought to bear on a specific proposal. Um, board members have to exercise their influence by convincing their colleagues about the provisions of a, of a general policy uh, ahead of time rather than just coming and, and uh, in a sense trying to beat up on their colleagues to get them to agree to something which is possibly just a, a personal hobby horse of a particular board member or staff member come to that. Uh, the other thing then is that we, our, our monitoring process and monitoring systems can be much more direct, they can be much more focused uh, and therefore much more efficient and more effective in terms of the way the board uses its time because uh, such monitoring information as the board receives is focused on the board's ability to check whether staff plans and staff actions have been policy consistent or policy compliant. Next slide please. Now I want to just talk briefly about the process of policy making and, and uh, some thoughts that might be useful uh, around that. Again, uh, hopefully getting on board will give you more of a steer on this. But it's, it's really interesting uh, to think about policy making as being something which has a, a desirable sequence to it. And John Carver, who I mentioned before, has likened uh, the process uh, by uh, using the idea of mixing bowls to explain that policies are essentially a nested hierarchy. The way he explains that each level of policy is a container. It's a container of lower level policies. And that's why it's important that the policy making process should be conducted in the correct sequence. From the biggest issue to the smallest issue, or in other words, from the highest level policy with the broadest scope to the lowest level. Uh, and the more abstract policy uh, directions to the less abstract. So one thing follows another and hopefully in the examples of governance policies and getting on board you'll see the way that that hierarchy works. The examples often start with a very high level relatively abstract statement and then it is uh, brought down to more uh, lower level, more specific uh, types of, of policy that uh, fit inside that, that larger one. Uh, next slide please. One of the other major issues that boards confront when they're making policy uh, is how much policy do you actually need? Um, I've worked with boards in the past, usually of not-for-profit organisations, that I've asked to show uh, me their policy manuals and they get out big ring binders, well, at least in the past they have. Uh, these days you're more likely to find them online, but the effect is the same. Voluminous material, uh, which when you look at it closely isn't really policy at all. Often it's quite detailed procedure, quite prescriptive procedure. So I would like to, to suggest to you and challenge you that, that more is less. Uh, sorry, less is more uh, around this. And uh, I know a number of you uh, already have governance policy manuals uh, and the like. And in my experience, these very seldom need to be uh, more than 20 to 30 pages max. And even then with a lot of white space. So the test for me uh, in terms of how much policy do we need is, is quite an intuitive one. If I'm involved in a policy making process in a board that I'm on, I'm looking to try to reach a point where I can be confident that if the board approves the policy as it's currently drafted, we can confidently hand that policy on to somebody else to interpret and implement. And if you're sitting there looking at the words that have been written and you don't have that level of confidence, 
then it's a signal that you need to be clearer in whatever you're describing in terms of the policy, or you need to be more detailed. So just to, to conclude that, um, the, the uh, comments on the screen uh, underline that, that a board gets benefit from this in other ways too. It can see when it's got a, a simple policy framework that it can easily consult with, refer to. It can see what it has and has not said about its expectations. It, it can find out what it wants to review or invoke when it needs it. And it maintains it uh, to a standard that it needs. It's very easy with the changeover of board members and, and uh, you know, changes of chairs often is quite a significant uh, interruption in the policy uh, application process. I've worked with boards that are encountering problems that when I've looked at the governance policies, I've wondered why they ever got into the pickle that they had. And it's because they've lost sight of what they actually had in their policy. Uh, that raises issues about induction, which we might talk about uh, in the uh, second of the webinars. Uh, change the uh, slide, please, Helen. In this, this uh, final slide, I just want to give you a bit of a sense, and this is spelled out in getting on board, but give you a bit of a sense of what the governance policy framework might look like. So the starting point, which we talked about earlier, was uh, those owner aspirations and interests. So the board starts off by interpreting those and applying the values, as I said earlier, of those sitting around the board table. And in the first instance, it needs to be focused on purpose and priorities, the ends that it wants the organisation to achieve. Once it's done that, I would say that more than half the board's job is done, but as I also acknowledged earlier on, uh, the, the ends don't justify the means, and the board also needs to spell out means, both in order to protect the organisation, but also some means relate to the board's own job. And so we've got two types of means. Uh, the board means really you can think of as the board's job description and, and it covers off uh, various governance processes essentially. Another set of board means is about how it delegates its authority, usually to its uh, chief executive or, or whatever name that principal uh, employee of the board goes by. Um, and the third bit is, is the risk management framework, which controls usually the means that the uh, chief executive might use to achieve the ends that the board has set. And then the other category that I want to acknowledge is that chief executives, artistic directors, other senior staff need to set their own policies around the way the organisation operates. Uh, and that's beyond the purview of the board, but it's worth acknowledging that uh, that activity has to go on uh, as well. So next slide, please, Helen. Um, just want to acknowledge that we're coming to the towards the end. Uh, a few minutes left for further questions, but um, just wanted to book in that earlier slide just to remind you that you can get. Uh, uh, copies of Getting On Board from Creative New Zealand's website or by emailing uh, Cassandra Wilson. Um, also like to uh, point you in the direction of additional material uh, which we provide through, uh, through our own website, which is easily accessible if you go on to the BoardWorks International website and uh, uh, um, book and subscribe to our free online uh, periodical called BoardWorks because we're regularly writing about these sorts of topics and exploring them in ways that's not possible to do uh, in the short time that we've had this morning. So thank you, Helen. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Graham. That was really excellent and very insightful. We do have about three minutes left um, for questions. Um, I did receive a question from Richard Cunliffe from Arts Access Aotearoa, and he wants to know, is it fair to say that the purpose of the organisation will be found in its trustee, where the organisation is a charitable trust? That's certainly where I would start, uh, Richard. Um, but 
I'd also suggest to you, and this applies to other types of legal entity as well, it will apply equally, say, to the rules of an incorporated uh, society or, or the, uh, the constitution of a company, that the, uh, the references in the trust deed or in those, those other constitutional documents tends to be relatively permissive and relatively broadly stated. And there's still quite a significant job of work for most boards to do to, I suppose we can think of it as operationalizing those, those constitutions, to interpret and articulate what those purposes mean, both in the broad long-term sense, but also in the short term in terms of the sort of milestones uh, and outcomes, results and so forth that um, the board would want to be seeking in the short term. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question before we wrap up today's session? If you do, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six or you can pop a question into the Q&A box. No? If anyone thinks of anything that they might want to ask Graham, then feel free to contact Cassandra Wilson and she will pass the question on to Graham. Um, Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, on April the 9th, we'll be presenting the second webinar in the series, and this is very much going to be around putting the board to work. Um, we'll be in touch with further details, and we hope you can join us for the, the second of uh, these two webinars. Until then, I'd like to say a special thanks to you, Graham, for today's session. Uh, in spite of the technical challenges and um, my thanks to you all for being a part of it. We hope that you can put this material to good use in the board, boardroom.